Well, thank, you, thank you for coming on Sunday morning. It's really lovely to see anybody at all. <laughs> This is such a wonderful seminar. I've, we've just been enthralled. We've learned so much just uh, sitting in the audience and just wonderful um, presentations, remarkable. Much, much to think about. And it seems that I really just arrived the other day and we're leaving in a few hours. Returning to the north where it's 16 degrees <laughs> in New Jersey, so this is the end of the paradise. So I'm going to read a short story that's very new that I re just really wrote very recently. And then if you have any questions, I hope we'll have a little discussion. It's a very lonely occupation just sitting and writing and being very intensely involved with language. So astonishing to sort of look up and see actual people who are, quote, readers. I meet a lot of writers, but I don't actually meet that many readers. Almost everybody we know who is a poet is a reader of poetry. That is, I mean, almost every reader of poetry you meet is a poet. And once in a while you will meet people who actually read prose fiction or don't write it. But that's a sort of a small number. So, so thank you, those of you who are, who are here. The story is called Assassin, and it's read in a mediated voice. It's not my voice, please. Don't misunderstand this. Uh, don't identify me with this horrible person. She's a woman who probably looks different from me. And the setting is... The setting is not obvious, it's obviously not this country, and it's, it could be this time. And some of the preoccupations may seem a little familiar to you. Assassin, assassin, hissing sound like snakes. First came to me through the steam radiator, waking open mouth and the inside of my mouth raw and festering from what had been done to it while I'd been made to sleep, a drugged sleep in this terrible place. Then the whisper of hope, assassin, assassin. The room I was assigned at St. Clement House, this was the first insult. This was unforgivable. The room, the bed, the bed with the lumpy, smelly mattress on a high floor of the house, had to climb stairs with my swollen ankles and wait panting like a dog, had to make my way along the winding corridor like a rat in a maze, insult at my age. Pre-diabetic was the diagnosis, hypertension. To be assigned such sleeping quarters in a bloody attic, low ceiling, no privacy, I would have to share a dreary dripping laboratory with strangers It was not fair or just. St. Clement House where residents are the staff and the staff are the residents. You will look out for one another, they told us, smug bastards, all of them. There are paid nurses and nurses' aides and attendants, but not many of these. And so we are all obliged to assist one another, unpaid, when required. Dr. Schumacher is the resident psychologist, but Dr. S does not reside in the house and does not linger in the house any longer than is necessary, for the bastard is clear of us by 5 a.m. and is on his way. I was meant to be an equal of Dr. S, for I am educated but was cheated of my destiny by reason of my sex, female. Also unacknowledged enemies in the government. After my discharge from the hospital where I was kept against my volition for eight months, deemed not ready to return to a normal life and so sentenced to a halfway house as it is laughingly called. And now the worst insult to be assigned to one of the fifth floor dormer rooms where at 53, I am old enough to be the grandmother of most of the residents. And I am not a junkie or a souse. I am not gaga like some. I am not a filthy slut, hardly, but forced to cohabit with such crippled specimens of humanity for the sake of a bed and food to eat until I'm well enough again to live by myself and tend to my own needs. My only friend does not live here. My dear friend, like a sister I have known since St. Agatha's grade school, is Pris Rians, who is my age and stout like me and with a plain, honest face, like raw bread dough. When I am well enough again, Pris Reese had said I might live with her in a room in her house if I could pay just a few dollars a week to help with rent and expenses. It is very surprising. Pris Rians is a cleaning woman for the PM himself. Would you believe that? And yet it is so. For 30 years, Perseverance has worked for the same cleaning service that is assigned to the PM's residence at Queen Square. But if you ask the woman what the PM is like, she will blink and stammer and seem not to know. I guess I don't see much of him or any of them. A dull female, not like me. 
Well, I know that Perseverance cleaned the PM's residence and had done so for many years, but it never struck me much until the other day, waking like I did, stunned and swallowing, not knowing at first where the hell I was, hissing in the radiator. Assassin. Oh, I love the sound of that word. Assassin. Not killer, not murder. Those are common words, not even executioner. Though there's something about that word I'm beginning to admire. Assassin, executioner in the service of fairness and justice. The insult in my room on the fifth floor and how we are fed here in the halfway house. Cold, gluey oatmeal one morning, and when I spat out a mouthful onto my spoon, disgusted to see what resembled a small, wizened piece of meat. Your own heart, the whisper came to me, laughing. Yet the idea of assassination did not occur to me for some time. I, I've lost track of the days since that time. It might have been a month at least. What began in a hissing in a dream and spread out of the dream like a potato sprouting roots in dank soil. Assassin. So somehow it came to me, I would saw off the head of the arrogant bastard PM. This would be my destiny, not the other. Not to be Dr. S and loitered over the mentally enfeebled addicts and sluts, for I'd been cheated of that career. But this, I would not be cheated of and would go down in history, like the Hebrew Ju Judith in her triumph over Holophanes. Assassin, assassin. I was slow to realize and to accept as you would be if you won a lottery and did not dare to believe, have I won? The, the winner is me? Almost I could hear the clouds applauding on the TV. Hateful, arrogant son of a bitch, the prime minister was. You saw it clearly on TV. A bachelor he was, never married. No worse than any of them in any of the political parties, but the PM is top dog, deserving of his bloody head sawed off. And fitting the very person who scrubbed his filthy toilet should be the one to saw it off. You see, no one notices us. This will be our revenge. Squat, short, middle-aged female like Pris Rience and me, or me moves through the world invisible. She, I, have bunions, varicose veins, swollen ankles. She, I, are short of breath, making our way upstairs. Hell, we are short of breath, making our way downstairs. Not five feet three, 170 pounds. No one has glanced at us in decades. Not a man or a boy in memory. We are deserving of respect as any of you, yet we do not receive your bloody respect. So bloody hell with you. In fact, this is our strength. An assassin in the figure of a middle-aged cleaning woman, flush-faced and panting on the stairs. Breasts like balloons collapsed to her waist, fattish thighs and buttocks in a nylon uniform. Who'd suspect? What, are you daft, man, that cow? That's the cleaning woman, for Christ's sake, man. Let her through. Something like this it was that transpired that morning. Very cleverly, I ground up a half a dozen sleeping pills to dissolve and reads coffee which the woman so dilutes with cream and sugar, it's not even coffee any longer, but some disgusting sugar concoction. And they're trying to say to me that I'm the one who's pre-diabetic. And so there was no difficulty for me to put on Pris Rian's uniform, which when she was fast asleep and snoring with her vast mouth agape. And indeed, the stretch waist nylon trousers fitted me like a fist in a glove. No difficulty for me to impersonate Pris Rian, who was near enough to me to be a twin sister. So that even if a security guard had thought to actually look at me, he'd have seen Pris Rience and not me, for it was Pris Rience's ID photo pinned to my bosom, slipping to my waist. And we would not have given an ID a second glance, either out of repugnance for that sort of female bosom. Also, Pris Rience wore an insipid knitted cap to disguise her thinning hair, which suited me too. Okay, ma'am, go on through. If a man does glance at you, if you are Pris Rience or me, his eyes are glazed with boredom. Not for an instant does he see. Wave through security without a hitch. Exactly as planned. Dragging a vacuum cleaner on wheels, mop and bucket, canvas bag in which was stuffed sundry cloths, brushes and cleaning materials. From innocent queries posed to Pris Rience, I ascertain which corridor to take into the PM's private rooms. And there, swiftly, I left behind the cleaning items and sought out the bloody bastard in the swanking interior, for whom I was feeling a fierce hatred, as if, in a dream of the night before, the PM had insulted me to my face, as many others have done. You would be surprised, as I was, how swiftly I moved on my swollen ankles, which would make me realize, and reflecting back over this episode, how the assassination was a foregone conclusion, like a final move in a chess game. 
except until just recently the assassin had not been named. And I would wonder if they had sought out others as the assassin in this case, and those others had proved inferior. And so they had settled upon me with the knowledge that I would not disappoint. For they must have known of me, my previous life, my education that had come to nothing, the sharpness of my intelligence blunted by myriad disappointments, which not a single one was my fault. In the man's bedroom in his black silk stocking feet, there the PM stood before a three-way mirror frowning as he buttoned a crisp iron white cotton shirt, dress shirt, with his back to the door unsuspecting, for Perse Rience would never have dared enter any room in the residence without knocking meekly beforehand, and if there was no knock, there could be no intrusion. If no intrusion by a stranger, there could be no sudden blow to the head from behind, no swift rushing to the penumbra of the mirror. There was no chance for the targeted one to draw a breath to escape the hard blow of pewter urn selected from a mantle, fairly cracking the eggshell skull in that moment. You will know, to do, you will know what to do as you do it. The hissing voice had instructed out of the radiator. And so it was, in an adjoining kitchen. There were fancy sharp knives on a magnet board, and these I selected a knife with a double serrated ed blade. And for the next half hour or more, I was engaged in sawing off the head of the bloody PM as he lay the helpless on the floor on the fancy thick-piled carpet. This career politician, quote unquote, as he was known, he had so many enemies in our country, and a number of them would rejoice in my actions and thank me for my patriotism. To sever a living head from a living body is no easy task and is very bloody and tiring, as you might imagine, but the PM was deeply unconscious from the blow to his skull and could put up no resistance. The head, that's capital H, as I would call it, was mine as soon as the head was severed from the body. It was larger than you would think, and it was heavier, and very bloody, with veins and sinews and twitchy nerves dripping nonstop from the ragged neck. And the skin of the face was coarse and darkening, as if with chagrin. And the eyes were half shut, droopy littered like a drunkard's. And the hair, which was thin, grizzled gray, not a handsome whitey silver, such as you were accustomed to see on the PM in his public appearance. A hairpiece, which evidently the PM would fix upon his head when he left his quarters. Missing your hairpiece, are you, love? The wise crack issued from my lips, unbidden. I wondered if this would be a new trait of mine, a coquettish sort of wit. <laughs> For it was very unlike my usual self in the presence of men, I can testify. Almost the kind of sharp wit you encountered on TV. The head was too stunned to respond. Of the eyes, the left had all but disappeared inside its socket, while the right was trying very hard to fix me in focus to determine what was what. For the PM had not gotten to his position in the government without being sharp-witted. Out of kindness as much as mischief, I sought out the hairpiece in an adjoining bathroom. And this I placed on a near bald scalp and adjusted as best I could. For even in his decapitated state, the PM was something of a ladies man. <laughs> Almost you had to smile to register a man's vanity at such a time. Soon then, I would exit the PM's chambers, trailing vacuum cleaner, mop, bucket, and canvas bag. And in the bag, wrapped in plastic to prevent the blood from soaking through, the head. And a dollop of disinfectant to make the nostrils pinch. Leaving the PM's residence, you are not scrutinized. There is only precaution against bringing a deadly instrument into the residence when you exit by a different door. And not a one so much glanced in my frumpy direction. Still, it was early, not yet 8 AM. If they'd had their wits about them, they might have wondered why the cleaning woman was leaving so early, but indeed they took no more notice of her than of a fly buzzing to be let out. From Pris Rians, I knew that the shiny black limousine to bear the PM across town to the Capitol building would not appear until 8.30 a.m., and so no one would miss the deceased until then. The headless body I'd left covered with a quilt from the disheveled bed. Being headless, a body is of not much interest, and interchangeable with others of its sex, it seemed to me. And Pris Rian's rubble-soled shoes, with her ID removed from my bosom, and a coarse net, knit nylon cardigan of unusual shade of lavender that re resembled nothing of Pris Rian's, and the insipid knitted cap removed, I took the Lanzan trolley to the end of the line. 
There's a place here I know that I have not visited in years, but I'd once known well, down behind a boardwalk by the beach, in an area of the beach that is no longer much frequented, and here the head would not easily be discovered. My plan was to bury it in the coarse, damp sand with care, for this part of the assassination seemed to be left to me to devise. And as it often happens, a know-it-all will instruct you to do what to do, but neglect to include the complete instructions. So you must uh, supply them yourself. Women are familiar with this, it is not surprising to me. The head comprehended my plan for the right eye was fixed upon me with alarm, though luridly bloodshot that I was sharp focused. Don't abandon me, it begged. Such nonsense. I wasn't about to listen to such nonsense. In life, the PM had a wheedling way about him that was often remarked upon. So that, though a right proper bastard that had cheated hapless working men and women of their wages and cheated on his own taxes whenever he could, he had a wheedling way about him that could be charming. One quart of Scott's blood, it was said of him. One of the sly ones who would get his bloody way if he were not careful. So I hid, the, I hid the head in a safekeeping place behind a shuttered stall, still in the canvas bag, but it was a grimy bag and the most desperate eyes not worth stealing. By this time, I was very hungry, and so I wanted to have a snack on the, board, on the boardwalk. A jammy, a Greg's sausage roll, a little packet of pork sc scrapings, a, a Cornish pastry and tea cakes, tea cake and chips and gravy. That's her snack. And then, she return, I, then I returned, and there inside the bag was the head, flush-faced and chagrined, and the left eye adrift, but the right eye blinking in the harsh oceanside light and accusing. Don't abandon me, please. Your secret is safe with me. I will not tell them what you've done. And most piteous, don't bury me like garbage, I beg you. The head most feared being buried alive. I took pity on the head, for I could understand how it felt in such circumstances. Oh, in a few days, I would come to a decision, I thought. In the meantime, the head is doing no harm. We are in a sheltered place where there is no one here, and it cannot escape, of course. I have set it on a platter with some moisture beneath to keep it moist, as you would keep a succulent plant moist. Now the bleeding has stopped, mostly. Atop the scalp, I have affixed a silvery hairpiece, as the head is anxious not to be seen without it. Soon, the head has become a familiar presence like a husband of many years. Once I'd had a husband, I think I remember this, but not the actual man and not myself as a wife, I don't remember. Please have pity on me, please love me. Don't bury me, the head dares to whisper, and kiss my lips, I love you, please. <laughs> but at this request, I just laugh. I would not kiss your lips or any of his bloody lips. I am calculating where to bury you, in fact. Farther out the pebbly shore, but deep enough so the gulls don't smell you and dig you up, and cause a ruckus. No, I'm too smart for that. Fact is, I'm just sitting here having a rest, and I'm thinking, and when I'm finished thinking, I would know more clearly what to do, and I'm not taking bloody orders from you, my man, or from any man ever again. Thank you. So the subject of the, the very exciting theme of this seminar is under the influence and sorts of influence and the whole uh, this mythology of women beheading men. It just seems to be, uh, as they say on Twitter, tre trending on social media. You know? <laughs> and we have the great paintings, uh, the Renaissance and Baroque paintings of Judith beheading Holofernes. And there's something about the, the mythopoetics uh, just the visual imagery of these great, these great lurid paintings of a female exacting the most extreme sort of revenge against the, the male who has, uh, who has terrorized her. A kind of, it seems like an obvious displaced castration, but because the head, as I've said in the story, the head is so particular and so specific, it becomes in some strange way an emblem of the very specific nature the individual nature of a ma masculine domination of, of women, that though it's an essence and an abstract thing, it's also very particular, and each, each woman, each person uh, has their own, uh, their own sort of nexus of, of uh, exploitation. So the story that I, that I wrote, I was at, I should have explained 
I wrote this in Dublin. I was at the ghost, it's ghost Story Festival, the Dublin Ghost Story Festival. And there was something about being in Dublin, walking around that, that wonderful city, and sort of hearing the, the voices and the rhythms and thinking of a different but analogous world, different from our world in America and yet analogous. So if anybody has any questions or remarks about anything, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer for a few minutes. Please yes. stand to ask your yes. question and wait for the microphone to come to you. Ms. Oates, this was the first lecture that referred to biblical influences in this whole seminar. Oh. Uh, could you comment on biblical allusions and archetypes in your other work and the importance of this? Well, I guess the Bible is such an immense influence. It sort of seems like the part of our whole cultural environment. I mean, one almost just takes it for granted and doesn't think about it, but you're quite right. I hadn't heard that mentioned either. Well, I think the most obvious myths are the myth of the Garden of Eden and the sort of the sense that we've fallen from some, some earlier plane of innocence and goodness. That's sort of all pervasive. I think that may not be a specifically biblical myth. It may, be, it may provide, uh, pervade other cultures as well. And then any kind of Christian the Christian ideas of, uh, specifically Christian ideas of, of redemption and resurrection, forgiveness of sins, uh, that certainly pervades my writing. I wrote a whole novel called Son of the Morning, which is about a Protestant preacher. I took some time off and I read the New Testament, I read the Gospels over and over again and really saturated myself in the rhythms and the wonderful imagery, very thrilling imagery of those, those books of the Bible. And there was even a time when I had memorized a lot of Bible verses. I was a girl, I had memorized 100, 100 Bible verses, beginning in the book of John. And I um, wrote a novel about a Protestant boy who is converted, he becomes um, a born-again Christian, though I don't use those words. It's a very individual experience for him, Nathan Victory in this, Victory in this novel that I wrote some years ago. So the whole thing is just pervaded with, with that imagery. And then in more recent years, I think I make, uh, make reference very often to, to the Bible. That's a good question, yes. But here we're sort of focusing on the Old Testament which is uh, so wonderfully lurid with tales of revenge and, and justice, it's social justice exacted by any means possible. <laughs> oh, and I should just say one more thing, I'm sorry. I, in my new novel, Book of American Martyrs, the, uh, the whole first part is narrated by a man who sees himself as a soldier of God. He's based upon, uh, there was a little a literal, uh, very right-wing evangelical Christian group called, I think they were Soldiers of God, and they may not exist any longer, but I think their website is still up. They were the, they were the outlaw people who, maybe they still do, who picketed abortion clinics, and in some cases they firebombed the abortion clinics and in a very few cases, they assassinated the abortion providers. There been, there's a whole history of that. So my novel, Book of Mar American Martyrs, is actually about that. But from the point of view of the man who's the assassin, he doesn't see himself as a murderer. He sees himself as a soldier of God, and he's protecting the unborn babies who are due to be aborted that day. He feels that he's been called upon. Most of the novel is not about him, actually. It's about the abortion provider and his family. So it's a novel that has a kind of balance. And approximately half the novel is evangelical Christians, and that's all pervaded the whole biblical sense of mission, that everything is ordained by God. Each soul is, is with God. Uh, no, no human being is without a soul, and no soul is, is contemptible, that all souls are sacred. So the abortion, the anti-abortion people feel that they're soldiers. 
So I got into that imagery very, very intensely. So thank you for your question. Yes, there's another one. Yes. Did you have a particular um, Judith and Holofernes painting in mind as you were writing? You know, I really didn't. The, there's the famous Car Caravaggio is probably the one that one would think of. And then I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, Artemisia Gentilisi. <laughs> and that's the one, the, that painting is six, was painted between 1640 and 1620. And that painting is on the cover of my book of stories, The Female of the Species. So as I say, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name. Artemisia Gentileschi? Gentileschi, yeah. Yeah, and I think Klimt also has a painting. Caravaggio is, is more, more well known, I think. But I didn't necessarily have these paintings in mind while I, because when I was in Dublin, I was sort of listening to the voices and, and feeling this sort of female rage toward the, the tyranny of the patriarchy that's been going on for you know, millennia. And this person, so all coming together in this person, and she sees the prime minister on television, and it be, he becomes the focus for her rage, which is very often the case with people who are the targets of assassins. In some way, they're like the accidental targets of a good uh, pent-up resentment and anger that's been going on maybe for decades, just focus on this one person. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for uh, waking me up on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Thank I, you for I assume coming. that's true of most of the other men in the audience, too. <laughs> my, my question is one about the uh, word assassin. My memory may be faulty, it often is. I recall that this, the word assassin is a derivative of, from the Arabic world of people who were fed hashish in order to get them into a state of mind so they would do such deeds as you described. Yeah, Am I right or wrong in that? Well, you're probably right. That sounds, that sounds very, uh, very plausible. In this case, the, it was sort of like the hissing out of the radiator, you know, like assassin. And this word that gave a totally anonymous and uh, insignificant person gave her a sense of mission and sense of identity, like she is going to be the assassin. Then, then much later, I mean, really not at the time I wrote the story, because I wrote this back in July 2018, so <laughs> just fall. Just by chance, we, I, my husband and I happened to see the film Eraserhead. <laughs> Maybe nobody's seen it in this room. It's so weird, but anyway, there's some little warming kind of comes out of the radiator, and I thought, wow, that is so completely weird. But my story is not influenced by David Lynch, who was actually written before that. So the idea of some waking up and hearing this, this hissing thing, and I think people who are on the verge of some sort of psycho psychosis, they're given this sense of identity. You know, isn't it better to feel, though you're deranged and demented, you feel like you're on Earth for a mission, for a reason? And she sort of thinks she will always be remembered, just like Judith in the Bible. It's maybe better for some people to think that than to feel that their life has no meaning whatsoever. Uh, maybe a couple more questions, yes. Okay. Um, the gradual ho homing in on the target in this story reminds me of a, uh, a story that you wrote in Harper's about 20 years ago about an ex-husband stalking an ex-wife, and I wonder if you remember that story, if you could comment on the inspiration for that story. The story called Stalking, wasn't it? Uh, I, I'm not sure that I really would recall it in much detail. The, uh, the idea of, the, of hunting, a, hunting a target, I think, and fit, being suffused with a sense of mission, it's probably the same sort of, uh, same sort of plot, you know. No, I can't, I can't, I'll maybe talk to you later because I can because nobody else has read that story. <laughs> and I think there was another, yes, yes. Hi, um, thank you for reading the story, Great Sunday Morning. So I wanted to ask about time in the story. I, um, you know, if I were reading it, I would go back and look for the clues. It seemed as though she was in the home 
and that's where the radiator was, and she's going to stay with her friend, but then she takes the uniform on. So I wondered if what you were thinking about time in the story and how time plays well, when she as part of the narrative. When she first gets her sense of mission, she doesn't really understand it, and she, she, it takes a while for her. She says like a month goes by before she really, and then maybe she sees the, the prime minister's picture somewhere. And so it, I wanted to give it a sort of plausible gestation time. You don't get an idea to assassinate somebody and go and do it in the next half hour. You know, you have to, some of us plan a little bit and we outline and we do all these, look, you know, get, get ready for, it's so like a theatrical event. And then she's staying with her friend and she puts sleeping pills in her, fr her friend's tea. She dissolves them so her friend doesn't know that. She puts on her friend's uh, cleaning woman outfit and, and her, uh, her ID. But I often thought that the people who get, who get really close to leaders are not even so much their associates in government, but the, the invisible and unnamed clean, house cleaners and, and maids and, and people who are doing the toilets, you know, and people scrubbing the floor. And these anonymous people kind of scurrying around in the background that, that the, the great men would not even glance at, just sort of take for granted. And those would be the very people who would be um, most suited for assassins. <laughs> And then the fact that she's so bulky, like men don't even look at her anymore, and so I'm going to show you, you know, like nobody's looked at me in, in 30 years, and so that's my, I'll use that to my advantage, and they won't look at me and won't notice when I leave and when I'm coming in and so forth. Okay. Yes, maybe one more question about yeah, any, we, anything? Yes, we have time for one. Thank you. Um, as I was listening uh, to your reading, I, I closed my eyes and I heard a lot of sibilance in the reading. And I didn't know whether it was intentional, but it was fun for me on the word assassin and then a lot of the words that you used. And then I had the sense when the story developed that uh, there was a hissing throughout the thing, and as if you were hissing <laughs> at a man and a contemporary man who wasn't paying his taxes, a patriarch of sort. And then I was thinking <laughs> of discussions I had with my wife about contemporary politics. And, and I'm sure that I'm reaching, but, but, <laughs> but it really, it was almost poetic as I was just sitting here. And, uh, and, I, was, uh, and I guess my question is, uh, am, am I reaching way too far? Not at all. <laughs> if you were my student at Princeton, you would get an A+. Plus. <laughs> Thank you.